So welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, thanks for signing in to our webinar this afternoon. We're going to be looking at um, a couple of lessons to teach about censorship and a free press with, library, with primary sources from the Library of Congress. Uh, if you could please, in the chat section, just let us know your name, the subjects and grade levels you teach, and your city and state where you're joining us from. That would be terrific. My name is Sarah Badawi. I work at Constitutional Rights Foundation here in Los Angeles. And my name is Damon Huss, and I work with Sarah here at Constitutional Rights Foundation. And hi, everyone. I'm Julie Shaw with the Bear Education Foundation, chiming in from Chicago, Illinois. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. And I see a couple of people are introducing themselves in the chat. When you use the chat box, which, sorry, by the way, to, to locate that, on the bottom of your screen, you should see a little um, like speaking bubble. Um, just click on that to open the chat and make sure that you've addressed your chat to all panelists and attendees so that everybody, um, not just us panelists, can see who you are and where you are. We've got people joining us from Maine, from a couple of other parts of California. Um, Mary Lynn, I'm not sure where you're joining us from. Oh, there she is from Buffalo, New York. So welcome. So I'm going to just give you a quick overview of the project uh, from which the, the lessons that we're going to be looking at today originated. Um, over the last couple of years, Vera Education Foundation, Constitutional Rights Foundation, and DePaul University have worked together under a grant from the Library of Congress's Teaching with Primary Sources program. Uh, to develop lessons that would allow teachers to inject civic learning across the disciplines so that in other words besides social studies and civics teachers who often have a, a focus on civic learning that we wanted to find a way and create lessons that would allow english language arts teachers math teachers and science teachers as well to um, to include and incorporate civic learning into their subjects and into their classes um, for us, when, when we talk about civic learning, we're really talking about that in a broad sense of the definition. Um, we're, we're, we've developed lessons that incorporate research-based practices to really take civic learning beyond just teaching about voting or about the Constitution, and really getting into looking at the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that will allow students to become effective and engaged citizens. So we've worked really hard to develop lessons that foster critical thinking, that give students important content knowledge, that train them in how to access information and be critical consumers of that information, and also, ultimately, we hope to, to care about issues that they learn about and feel like they can make an impact. Um, our lessons also are really informed by the C3 framework. Some of you may already be familiar with that, but that's a framework for sort of fostering um, student readiness for college, career, and civic life, um, which has been used by a number of states as they've kind of improved and refined their state social studies standards. So all of our lessons developed as part of this project uh, are aligned with the key uh, indicators and standards of the C3 framework. Right, this is Damon. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what we're going to do today as part of this webinar. Uh, we're going to have a walkthrough of a high school level lesson that's focused on the subject that we mentioned, free, free press in wartime. Uh, but we are going to also talk about the middle school lesson uh, throughout today's webinar. Uh, and you'll see that the materials that we're going to show you are designed, as Sarah mentioned, for social studies. But they can be used in an ELA classroom as well because there are some text-based uh, uh, primary sources that would be perfect for using uh, you know, non-fiction text in an ELA course. Um, the materials are also designed to meet the best practices for civic education. As Sarah mentioned, uh, the C3 framework was an important consideration in how we designed it. And that involves the inquiry arc or inquiry-based uh, teaching that Julie's going to talk to you about in a few minutes. And the materials have also been reviewed and tested by teachers themselves in the classroom 
And we incorporated feedback from those teachers in how we designed and revised the lesson. So these are the lesson objectives for the two different lessons that we're talking about, the middle school lesson on the left, the high school lesson on the right of your screen. Uh, in the middle school lesson, the content focuses on uh, students defining terms like sedition and censorship, and also looking specifically at the Sedition Act of 1798 uh, that uh, criminalized any criticism of the Federalist president of the time, John Adams, or the Congress of the time, which was dominated by the Federalist Party. And students also synthesized the knowledge that they gained from looking at primary sources related to that by creating a visual message or poster that explains the importance of freedom of the press today. Then there's a the high school lesson that we're going to focus on for the duration of this webinar. And in this, we're going to focus on, the, on content related to World War I era uh, a World War I era political cartoon, but also, as I mentioned, text-based primary sources to help students distinguish two different kinds of censorship. One is government censorship, and the other is voluntary censorship, or you might call self-censorship in the press, but which was also, of course, uh, encouraged by the government. Uh, just so happens. Uh, and then they'll synthesize their knowledge of those things when they uh, compose an email at the end to a local news source expressing their views on freedom of the press. So let's jump right into the lesson that we're going to look at today, uh, which begins with a brief discussion here of fundamental freedoms in the First Amendment, especially freedom of the press. But I just want to let you know that the discussion we're having applies to both the middle school and high school levels of the lesson. So let's look at the introductory discussion question. After students discuss what the fundamental freedoms are, what freedom of the press is, then they look at how they themselves get news of the world. And I'm going to pose this question to you, our participants. Where do you find out about what's happening in your community and world? Or where do you get your news? And go ahead and share your answers in the chat area. In NPR, New York Times. TV news, social media, the internet, yeah. Lots of use of online news sources. Yeah, a lot of online news. You'll see here that I've chosen a couple of images here too from the Treasury of the Library of Congress uh, to show you some of the different methods that people might use. We have on the far left uh, a home computer. Just kidding. It's a Univac computer from uh, going back to 1959, all of which you see there, probably fits in uh, you know, a chip less than the size of my fingernail. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, a newspaper. That's a traditional newspaper. That's from 1889. And on the far right, you'll notice that image there is actually of a television. I was uh, really surprised to find out when I was looking up images on the Library of Congress website. That is an early uh, television receiver uh, from about 1930. So yeah. So all of those sources uh, that were listed uh, are pretty common. Those are similar to the sources I myself go to when I'm looking for news, um, especially uh, radio and uh, looking online. Students are then reminded of the First Amendment, as we talked about. This image also comes from the Library of Congress. And this is, a, is very clear that what, when we talk about government censorship, we are all automatically talking about the First Amendment. It's, impl it's implied whenever we talk about the government censoring what uh, private entities or private citizens may do. Um, so it's embedded right there, of course, in the First Amendment, connected to freedom of speech, which is also very important and very important to keep in mind. So the next part of the discussion, and you can write your answer in the chat area, is this question, what if the government shut down the news sources you just mentioned? So all the news sources you just mentioned, social media, the New York Times, NPR, et cetera, what if the government shut those down? Go ahead and think about it and then write uh, what you think that would look like in the United States if those were all shut down. And uh, we have a comment that you love the cartoon. Yes. Oh, you just used this, this, this same cartoon. That's great. Um, yeah, this cartoon, this is actually attached to the middle school lessons. The students actually look at this 
uh, as an example of a cartoon before they create their own poster in the middle school lesson. This cartoon actually dates from the early 70s. Uh, the Library of Congress has it dated somewhere between 1970 and 1977, probably during the Vietnam War era when there was uh, some government censorship going on of, of uh, press entities. Uh, Peter Green is the artist who created this. So we have some answers here. Uh, it, we have, uh, I feel lost and uninformed. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, and we have a question in what context, I think. Um, and then also, uh, it would be distressing because a lesson plan on my way to work. Yeah, that was, so there's, there's a, a real practical uh, professional uh, reason that it would be bad. Um, yeah, it would cause anger. Um, and then it would raise questions for people too. Yeah. That people would, would want to know, yeah, what are they trying to hide and why? Right. So it would, it would give kind of an immediate impression, of course, that the government is trying to, is censoring by and trying to hide information from the public, something that the public should not know. With that discussion, then students have in their minds that Number one, and one of the main reasons we chose this topic for these lessons, uh, not only in middle school and high school, but in the elementary school level as well, is that freedom of the press is so important. And we see that it has such a significance today uh, and has been under attack. And so we want to make sure that, that an appreciation for this First Amendment freedom uh, is um, uh, brought to students and students understand that. So what they do then is they have that understanding and they then turn to looking at primary sources. And this is the main part of the lesson. So to do this, students read a brief background on uh, speech and press restrictions that were enacted during World War I. We'll talk about that. And then when they look at the primary sources, Julie's gonna go into more detail with this and actually show you an example. But they first just observe a political cartoon, and they write down their observations. And then they look again at that same political cartoon, and they answer some deeper questions. And that means those are questions that help students re reflect and critically think about the sources. And uh, they do the same, not only with a political cartoon, but then finally with two text-based primary sources that give them more information about World War I press censorship and some of the implications of that for today. So as I mentioned, students first look at a background, and I'm not gonna, uh, I don't have it up on here on the screen for you to read the entire background. It's a one pager that students get, but here are some highlights of some of the essential information that students would need to know before they look, especially at those text-based primary sources later. Some of the background here, they learn about the Committee on Public Information, which was created about a week after the US declared war against uh, Germany and entered World War I. And this committee was created uh, to help shape public opinion in favor of the war effort. And it was made up of members of President Woodrow Wilson's cabinet, um, plus a special appointee to the committee. And one of the things that the committee did was it asked newspapers to practice voluntary censorship or self-censorship information that might otherwise sway the public against the war. So that was its mission, to get public support for the war. Then Congress passed in June of that year the Espionage Act. And the Espionage Act, as you see here, restricted free speech and freedom of the press. It made it a crime punishable by death, and I should add, or by 30 years, up to 30 years in prison, for anyone to promote the success of Germany or its allies in the war, as, as uh, the government might uh, interpret that. What Woodrow Wilson did in, or what, what the, the, the law, I should say, empowered the president to do was to enable the post office to then become the public censor. So the, pub, the post office had the power to label any materials that were offensive, quote unquote, unmailable. And that's gonna be an important term when students look at one of the sources. And finally, there was the Sedition Act, which was an amendment to the Espionage Act, uh, which prohibited even the expression of any negative opinions of the United States or even of the US flag. And the punishment for that included now a $10,000 fine and imprisonment. I should say that the Espionage Act was enforced even after uh, World War I. And to my knowledge, the only people who were executed actually got the death penalty under that were the Rosenbergs later for uh, espionage. All right, with that background information, 
The students then begin looking at primary sources, and I'm going to turn it over to Julie, who's going to talk about that and also the inquiry process. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for all that great um, information about the lesson, Damon. I think I think we can definitely um, make give us cause to think about um, what's happening today and and imagine. Um, you know, and really think about and appreciate our press and and what's going on um, today. But one thing I want to start about is, is just thinking about inquiry. And I'd like you to use the chat box to just um, take a minute to to write down a phrase or a quick sentence about what how you define inquiry. So again, if you can put that in the chat box to all panelists and attendees, um, what is inquiry? What does that mean to you? And while I wait for you here to um, type in, I'll share with you um, one definition that the Library of Congress uses is um, to describe inquiry as a process of active learning that is driven by questioning and critical thinking. Um, and so, right, open-ended questions that can be researched, uh, questions being self-directed to find the resources to answer those questions, Looking for an overarching question. Absolutely. Um, so again, one of the common themes we see here is, is really um, the student-centered approach, right? And so uh, besides being student-centered, is there any other um, reasons that you would call out to use inquiry in your classroom? What are some of the benefits that it has um, for your students? Again, if you could. Um, Use the chat box to type in a quick answer, response, right? It helps spark curiosity. Absolutely. Um, you can use it to judge the reliability of a source. Can I use it to answer this question? Absolutely. I think, you know, the library too would say, um, uh, and I think as many as you would agree, that students um, develop. The understandings that they develop through inquiry are deeper and longer lasting, right, than if it was just prepackaged knowledge delivered to teachers by, um, to the students, right? Um, again, it opens the door to more questions, absolutely. And, and the, the students are more invested now, right, because they're the ones who are asking the questions. And, and anytime you ask a question, you're more invested in, in learning the answer. So primary sources and inquiry, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, and primary sources really engage students in the inquiry process. They transform the learning by provoking students to question, make inferences, interpret different points of view, use critical thinking skills to analyze and evaluate, draw conclusions, and pull together disparate pieces of evidence to think conceptually. Primary sources engage students emotionally and personally because they represent authentic voices and perspectives. They tell not just one story, but many stories that help students see the complexity of issues and recognize the importance of context for credible interpretation. Um, and yes, actually, this cartoon is one that we are going to, um, that's in the high school lesson, and we are going to analyze it together here. Uh, but before we do that, let me just give you, uh, show you a quick uh, snapshot of the Library of Congress Primary Source Analysis Tool, if you haven't seen it before. Um, this is available, this is the PDF version, and it's also available in an online version that actually has um, drop-down menus with guiding prompts that you alter the guiding questions based on the type of primary source that it is. But the main sections of the tool are observe, reflect, and question. And um, these sections really allow students to look to the source for information and details. So the observe, or what I actually see in that source. And then in the reflect, they connect what they see, read, or hear to what they know. Um, and then the questions, right? Um, what do you wonder about? What what about their observations or reflections caused them um, to question some things about that source? 
So in this lesson, you'll see, as we will point out, we kind of uh, are guiding the students to really start with observation, um, but really they, they should always be encouraged to move fluidly between the columns. And if there is a question, no matter when it comes up, um, that, that's a good thing to, to note. And finally, the further investigation box, that's something that you may or may not use but it is a place to kind of gather some of those questions that then you as a teacher or together as a class decide to investigate further. So let's take a look here at this source. And in the chat box, we'd like you to help us analyze this source together. And, and at first, describe what you see. So feel free to answer any of those questions. What do you notice first? What else do you notice? What is interesting? Very specifically grounding in the actual details of the source and things that you can see and point to. So what do you notice? What really strikes you and, and calls out to you? Uncle Sam, the Capitol building traders. I like that the IWW character seems almost to be a werewolf. Exactly, I think Sarah mentioned that same thing earlier. Uncle Sam is gathering up a bunch of people with labels slapped on them. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, there are, I think there's definitely some very specific points, right? The werewolf, Uncle Sam, the traitor, and back up to the capital. And Uncle Sam's size is compared to the others. Um, definitely. That is a, um, that's a great segue into our uh, next slide where we're going to focus a little bit on our observations and, and have us think about what that makes us think or feel and the questions that we might have. So here are some guiding questions, but feel free to put in any other reflections that you have. But if you might want to answer one of these in the chat box, what was happening when this cartoon was made? Who do you think it was the audience? What do you think maybe the cartoonist's opinion on the issue was? Um, again, or any other reflections that you have based on the observations that you made. Um, Helen talked about um, his size as compared to the others, and then he seems to be angry and taking control, right? Um, I think that's absolutely, and his size maybe saying that the is giving a sense of his relative his, meaning our government's relative power compared to the traitors. Um, so what else was happening at the time? A law was passed against sedition, which um, the cartoon is showing the U.S. government having the ability to round people up. Ooh, there's Sin Fine is holding a bomb. Nice, nice observation. That the U.S. government has control over things like the war and people's impressions of it. It's all male. Yep. Interesting. What about questions? What questions do you have? So really some really interesting reflections based on your observations. Um, what is IWW? Absolutely. Something to investigate. This is Damon. Yeah, the industrial workers of the world was a, a <clears throat> far left uh, union, actually, but it was it was a, made up of socialists and communists and some anarchists even. So definitely showing is them looks like that they need to be put down. Interesting as they, I think, too below the IWW our werewolf here is is a uh, a torch, so maybe that giving the impression that they're trying to trample liberty. Interesting, possibly. Oh, World War I inverted. Interesting. Uh, interested in the cartoonist. Did he work for a newspaper? Um, I would say likely, but definitely something to investigate. Really good ideas, but this, as you can see right here, just as through your own observation, reflections, and qu questions, you're really like drawn in and sucked in um, to this source and kind of wanting to know more. And that is really the power of primary sources right here and inquiry-based learning 
um, you've automatically got the students engaged and wanting to know more. All right, I'll hand it back over to Damon. So as I mentioned, once they, they look at that source, that visual source, then they look at two text-based primary sources. And I'll just tell you what these are. On the, the left-hand side there, that's a report by the Committee on Public Information in 1918. That's the committee that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's part of their background. And this is a report to President Wilson that describes how the press has mostly responded with, quote, honor and patriotism, unquote, to voluntarily censor itself with regard to military information. That's the location of bases and troop movements, and that kind of thing. And so the, the report gives a uh, very positive report about how the press has been doing that. The, the, the source there on the right, which you see says the masses up there at the top, I give, the title might give you a clue, but it's a letter from the editor of the masses. His name was Max Eastman. And it's a letter directly to Woodrow Wilson in 1917 after the passage of the Espionage Act. And in this letter, Eastman, who was a communist, himself, or at least he was a communist at the time, uh, complains to Will, President Wilson that an issue of the masses was declared unmailable by the post office. Uh, but he said the post office did not tell him exactly what was unmailable. And it's a really interesting source. It's, very, it's a very cordial letter from this communist uh, newspaper editor to President Wilson himself, uh, kind of in protest of the Espionage Act that had just been passed. Uh, and so that there's, that's an interesting communication. One thing to keep in mind, though, these two sources, I'm showing you little excerpts. These are excerpts of the excerpts that we actually use in the lesson, because the letter is, is quite long, and the, the report that includes this volunteer censorship portion is even longer. And so we excerpt them to be about a page and a half, a page and a half long sources for students to, to use, so they can really just focus just on the issues that we of censorship that we want them to really uh, investigate. And so that's what, what they do with these text-based sources. They use, however, the same primary source analysis uh, tool, the same primary source analysis type questions that Julie just showed you for the visual source to this text-based source. So they can just look at, you know, they can make observations. What do these sources look like? Uh, but also reflections. When, why do they think that they were published? Who is the audience for them and questions like that. And then they form their own questions, just as Julie demonstrated for you, about these sources. So the, the primary source analysis is, uh, is really the same, uh, but it's just in this different context using text. The lesson from there, after they've done that analysis, they then synthesize the information that they have uh, learned. And they do this first, they debrief with you, the teacher, using debrief quest debriefing questions on the material. And they synthesize their knowledge by drafting this email to the editor, like a letter to the editor, uh, in which they state their own understanding of freedom of the press. They share their opinion of press censorship during wartime, so they can use World War I as an example. And then they can make any connection that they might know of from what they've learned in class or from their own prior knowledge to any current or any historical US military conflict, you know, the Vietnam War or the war in Afghanistan, the war on terror, whatever it is that they can make a connection to, they can use that as an example as well to make it more contemporary or more within the knowledge that they might already have about war. And finally, they uh, have an extension activity where they can create a political cartoon similar to the example that they, that they have that Julie uh, showed you with you know, Uncle Sam and, and all those other characters, they can make their own political cartoon expressing their contemporary views about freedom of the press. And now I'll turn it over to Sarah to talk to you more about the project. Sure, thanks Damon. Um, and thanks Damon and Julie for, for taking us through all of the, the components of, of this high school lesson and, and highlighting some of the things that you can look for in the middle school lesson that deals with that, uh, the Sedition Act of, uh, of 1798. Um, so I'm going to show you two places where you can find and download the full lesson plan that we've just kind of given you a taste of here this afternoon. 
where you can find either the middle school version, uh, sorry, either the middle school lesson plan or the high school lesson plan. Um, the first place that they're housed is on the website of Citizen U, which is the website of the, the coalition of organizations I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. Um, and here at this uh, site, you can find both, uh, both of those lesson plans there. You can also find, access them from the CRF website, and I'll be sending you, um, when we send out the recording of, the, of this webinar tomorrow or maybe the next day, I'll include these links there for you as well in the email so that you've got them handy. Um, but on the CRF website, we have a part of our website of dedicated to teaching with primary sources where you can find, again, the, the middle school and the high school lesson plans. If these lessons sound like something you would like to give a try to in your classroom, we have a way for you to do that. Um, in order to give us some feedback, both about the webinar and then possibly about the lessons, I'm going to post in the chat box in just a second um, a, uh, a link to a flash survey, very, very quick four or five question survey to give us some feedback on this webinar. When you complete that survey, you will be entered into a lottery of five volunteers uh, to pilot the lesson for a $100 stipend. What that would entail would be teaching one of the lessons in your class and then completing a, a, a longer than our flash survey, a more comprehensive survey um, to provide more detailed feedback about the, about the lesson, about how it went with your students. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, you can note that in, the, uh, in your response to the, to the flash survey. Uh, the other thing that, that answering the flash survey will get you entered in is a chance to win a $50 gift card. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to go ahead and post the, uh, the link to the flash survey in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. For taking time out. I know it's a busy time of the school year. When isn't a busy time of the school year? <laughs> but, um, but anyway, thanks for, for joining us this evening. We'll hang around here online uh, for, for a little bit, but we understand if you have other things to, to get on to, but we'll be here and please stay in touch and we look forward to, to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone.